、えー、保持力の効率的な上げ方を教えてくださいないです大丈夫です効率的なのそれって<笑>まあ一番早いえー、保持力の効率的な上げ方を教えてくださいないです大丈夫です効率的なのそれって<笑>まあ一番早いビフィボルダーズメイドビデオオンウィッシュビーディイディオ BMI The Body Mass Index for Climbing They did so using the data from the top 16 athletes in the World Cup so of I don't remember which year While I can agree with some of the conclusions of the video, there are many, many buts in the video. First of all, the authors fall into the survival fallacy, saying that the best BMI for climbing would be the best that pro athletes have is simply wrong. And this is simply because most of the population wouldn't be able to perform at high levels or to even stay healthy when they're at the bottom limit of underweight. Secondly, the BMI is a pretty okay index when we're talking about the general population in predicting several health risks, but it's not the same, it is not as accurate when we're talking about athletes. This is because The muscles weight more than fat. So, this is why it's not uncommon or it is possible to see bodybuilders that are overweight according to the BMI cutoffs, but do not have that increase in risk for cardiovascular diseases that you will have with normal overweight. A better index could be fat percentage. But it's not as easy to calculate as the BMI, that is just simply a ratio between height and weight. Furthermore, from when the video was done, the IFSC changed the rules for the cutoffs that they accept for the BMI and has been increased. So now、uh, the cutoff is 19 for men and 18 for women. Fortunately, it seems that in the climbing community something is changing, and we are having more and more pro climbers or famous climbers talking about their struggle with nutrition and weight. I would also、uh, warn you against like, dieting too hard, and I think it's a rabbit hole that a lot of people,、uh, a lot of climbers,、uh, fall into and never get out of. So, like a lot of climbers have. Problems with eating disorders, I've had it as well、uh, in, my, in my youth. So, right now, I'm trying to actually gain a little bit of weight because I, I was a little bit lighter. And I don't know, I feel like my mood and everything, my, the, like the, the quality of life goes down. And for me, it's not worth it now that I'm not a professional anymore. I've gained a couple of kilos and、uh, I definitely feel it. But at the same time, I feel so much healthier. And, Just happier that I think it's worth it. You gain weight, it's okay most of the time, but if you have to camp or something and if you have to stop these kind of swings, that's when you really notice it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm of a very healthy weight, maybe even more healthy than, well, what, what is a healthy weight then, of course.、Um, I did have like an anorexic period. 
but what happened is that I just couldn't recover anymore. I was winning everything until I wasn't winning anything anymore and I was constantly tired. I didn't heal, I didn't have my periods, everything went to hell. Uh, some injuries started to happen and yeah, then it's just like there's no other solution than to start actually eating and building muscle. And we even have some documentaries on the topic. I can still remember a moment where I was climbing when I was really light. I just remember feeling like I was water over the rock. Growing up, my personality was always like, I want to be better than I am. I can be better than I am. But what are actually eating disorders? How do they manifest in sport? And also, importantly, are you healthy if you do not have an eating disorder? When thinking about eating disorders, we often think about anorexia. But according to the DSM-5, we actually have several different eating disorders. And we could say that we have four main. Anorexia nervosa is defined by severe caloric restriction that leads to loss of weight and distorted body image. The requirement of amenorrhea has been deleted in the last version of the manual. Binge eating disorder is now its own category and is defined by recurrent episodes of eating significantly large quantities of food, more than most people would, and feeling out of control while doing so. Bulimia nervosa is defined by recurrent episodes of binge eating followed by inappropriate behaviors to reduce weight gain, like self-induced vomiting, use of laxatives, and this must happen at least once per week over a period of three months. So which is the fourth eating disorder? It is the other specified or unspecified eating disorder. This kind of diagnosis you find it at the end of every section, almost every section of psychiatric and medical manuals. And uh, they are used to be able to help people who do not exactly fall into the diagnostic criteria, but still experience a significant impairment in quality of life, uh, areas, important areas of functioning and or feeling a significant distress. And these disorders are much more frequent than we would imagine. And this is especially true in the case of eating disorders in sport. Recent studies that looked at the frequency and prevalence of eating disorders in several disciplines actually showed that almost all cases of eating disorders fall into this category. And anorexia nervosa is only from zero to 5% of those cases. Also, regardless of sport or gender, Increased physical exercise followed by dieting are the most common strategies that are used to control weight and it's not purging behaviors. I just started, I started training more, but I ate the same thing. I just didn't like, I didn't think so much about it. I didn't intentionally eat less. I just like, I just trained harder. I just want to get stronger and continuously just eating the same thing. And I lost a lot of weight because of that and like I got strong fast but I still get sick like once every month more or less. This is why in the scientific literature we find information under the label of disordered eating compared to eating disorders. This allows to assess the symptoms in a broader way. Recent work and research identified what are the variables that most impact the probability of having symptoms for disordered eating. And using these models, they created also some interventions and prevention programs. Let me know if you are interested in those in a future video. Maybe I can do something more in depth about it. Finally, I think it's time to address the issue of healthiness without an eating disorder, that is, without a psychiatric diagnosis. Being underweight, that is, having a BMI underneath below 18.5, leads to several very negative outcomes. And this is irrespectively of having or not a mental disorder. And also, remember the muscles weight more than fat. So this threshold should be even higher for someone who is very physically active. 
an inadequate nutrition and or caloric intake can lead to osteoporosis, hormonal disruption, impaired immune system, increased risk of injury, alongside with impaired neuromuscular adaptation and mental burden. It's just continuously being sick again and it's like, and I'm like, why? Like I've tried like the, using carbs, I've tried to just use fat, I've tried doing the fasting, I've tried fasting and I've tried a lot of the like diets and lifestyles out there. And but the only like then it hit me. But the only thing I haven't tried was to, like kind of go back and eat a lot more food. Like because I've been eating nutritious food as well, but I wasn't eating enough food. The process of getting stronger implies that you make some small tears into your body, and your your system will activate an immune reaction that will repair your body, your tissues, and will make you stronger but your body needs the nutrients to do so. This is why bones, ligaments and tendons are most impacted when having a caloric restriction. Furthermore, joints and ligaments required enough body mass to be sustained, which explains why so many climbers have knee injuries. So what is the plan? You ready for a long session? I think, <laughs> yeah. you know, yesterday when I said my knee popped. Yep. Today it was feeling a lot worse when I woke up. I almost couldn't stand on my leg. Just started and the knee is hurting pretty bad so I can't really use it almost at all. Standing like straight on it but not pulling on it. It takes, takes about a week or two maybe to heal. Yeah. And I can just keep climbing. I mean, in this effect is so deteriorating in female athletes that it has a special name, the female athlete triad, which implies having disordered eating, osteoporosis, and amenorrhea at the same time. This condition leads to loss of bone density, which cannot be restored, cannot be regained. Once it's gone, it's gone. And also because of the misregulation or shutdown of the immune system, this poses a high risk of life-threatening illness in the long run. Again, very serious moment. Why is no one talking about it? Eating disorders inside and outside sport must be stressed more and more. But at the same time, the lack of an eating disorder shouldn't be an excuse to ignore extreme caloric restrictions or inadequate nutrition. Hopefully, the climbing community will soon recognize that anorexia is not the most common issue with eating and will try to support pro climbers with adequate professionals. So remember to eat enough calories, have lots of fruits and vegetables, drink a lot, sleep well, stay connected, and as always, stay psyched. And I'll see you in the next video.